This is the fifth day of the September 1981, seven days session. And we will continue and probably finish today with the with reading and commenting on the three refuges as taken from the Sutra of the Sixth Patriarch, from the chapter of Repentance Resolution, book published by the Buddha's Universal Church, translated by the brothers Feng and Feng from the Chinese. The second refuge, according to the to Wei Nang being, we take refuge in perfect view because it is the ultimate of the abandoning of desires. Our refuge being, I take my refuge in Dharma and resolve with all beings, I will enter deeply into the Dharma treasure and so forth. The meaning of the word Dharma It's a Sanskrit word and has many different translations. When it's with a small d, it just refer refers to things, phenomena, as they occur. With a capital D, usually refers to the teaching of the Buddha, and we read, we read some of those, we, some quotes, which is, was just the very tip of the iceberg. Thich Nhat Hanh once said, uh, referring to Buddhism, he said, it's like a vast ocean and you take out of it what is needed. Buddha himself, referring to his teaching, says it's like a raft to cross a river. After the raft has fulfilled its usefulness, one throws it away, one leaves it behind, one doesn't carry it around. It's been frequently read here too, but let's read this once more. I cannot hear it often enough. Do not go upon what has been acquired by repeated hearing. Go by. I go by what he says or I go by what she says, meaning following. An order, a commandment or a word, something that sounds good makes sense. Do not go upon what has been acquired by repeated hearing, nor upon tradition. Tradition can become a very sacred thing. Sac the sacredness being thinking. What is really sacredness? What is sacredness? and holiness. A tradition? <clears throat> holiness means wholeness. It's the same root. is their wholeness in oneself, which already putting it into words is an impossible question, statement. Is their wholeness in seeing? Wholeness in listening. Wholeness in listening is the same as wholeness in seeing, because all the senses are whole. They work as a whole not with separate interpretation of what is seen, what is heard, separate words, separate channels up here in the cortex. Which are there, 
Kenne not immediately be ins incited and triggered when something is seen. But the seeing be whole. Whole energy, whole attention, whole awareness. nor upon a tradition, nor upon a rumor, we all love rumors, give a little zip and zest to our life. <laughs> what's happening? What's happened? And anything will be gobbled up or at least chewed over with friends. And one doesn't even know whether this is so. One talks about some something that's going on with ever, never, without ever having been there. But one goes by what has been heard and what has been rumored. nor upon what is in a scripture. Yeah, dangers of that. People were burned at the stake because they, in what they said, there was contradiction to what was in the scripture, the Bible, the Quran, you name it. I don't think this has happened in Buddhism. Although I don't know. I don't know. Usually the traditional thing of Zen masters have been to outright repudiate what the other guy has said, to say, say something different, to keep this thing alive. And one must not just make a formula out of this and say, well, this is um, blaming by praising. How do you know it is? No, praising by blaming. Maybe the guy really meant that. He was a jackass or something. <laughs> always tries to read something behind each gesture and saying of a Zen master. He must know what he's saying. And there must be profound something or other behind it. He's a human being. So is she. Yet if something is clearly seen, can it be said, regardless of what has been said by somebody else? That's what this armor dueling was all about. Can one encounter each other freely, unintimidated, no images? Nor upon an axiom. An axiom means a, a fixed principle has been established. Somebody has established it to just to start with something. It's not a truth. Nor upon specious reasoning. Specious meaning, if I understand the language right, uh, arbitrary, not sound, based on what has really been seen as, as being so, as being factual, as being true nor upon a bias toward a notion that has been pondered over, nor upon another's seeming ability. How can one tell 
person seems so capable. This is where it comes in. One must be able to tell for oneself. By what standards? By none. Only then is there clear seeing when there are no standards. Standards are arbitrary, set up by tradition. And tradition is arbitrary, always influenced culturally by the times and so forth, the location, the climate, people's biases. Just because a person is a a Buddhist monk doesn't mean he doesn't have biases. Or does he? One must assume neither, but find out directly. Nor upon the consideration, this person is our teacher. Which is an image. People want an infallible teacher. Why? So one doesn't have to think and find out for oneself. It's more comfortable and safe this way and, and easier. One can sit back a little bit. Take over lock, stock and barrel, what the teacher says. Find out what his lock, stock, and barrel means. Have something to do with cannon? I'll look it up. When you yourselves know beyond doubt these things are good, these things are not false, these things lead to goodness and happiness, then enter on and abide in them. Which again is the Admonition, find out for yourself. It's all right to listen to what a teacher has to say and to see whether one can see in oneself the truth or the falseness of the words. Mm -hmm. Or read. Depending on how one reads, can one read with an open mind, discerning, looking and listening at the same time. Not just reading the words. That's how we read textbooks. And then we store that, and then we regurgitate it on a test. <laughs> <laughs> of course, there's more to than that from this knowledge. We may be able to be a very capable doctor or capable architect, or what have you. Dharma, the word Dharma also refers to this law of cause and effect, which one hears so much about and talks about. Things arising according to causes and conditioning and ceasing when causes and conditions change. Such formulations, at least for this person, always being quite remote and abstract. Pricking oneself in the finger, there's blood. planting a seed, a zinnia seed. There's a little bit of green coming out of the ground, growing. And there's a flower, a seed, and a frost, and the thing is brown, mushy. In the Buddha's teaching, the law, cause of law, the, the law of cause and effect, refers primarily to that there is this fact of universal suffering. Universal. Not just in this person and in that person. Universal suffering in all human beings. And that there is a cause to that, a cause.
cause for universal sorrow, a cause for sorrow in one human being, a cause being selfishness, to put it simply, ignorance, inattention. Selfishness is always inattention, and in inattention there is selfishness, because in inattention one doesn't see everyone else and everything else, only one's own concerns, one's infatuation with oneself, or despair over oneself, which is the same coin, just two sides of it. So the fact of universal <coughs> sorrow and the fact that there's a cause for that in each individual <coughs> human being. And that cause is not different in other human beings. We all rotate in this whirlpool of selfishness in which there's greed, anger, feelings of incompetence, impotence, inadequacy, insufficiency, and all the sublimations, the ex escapes from that, into power trips, into trips. It's not unique to you or me, or to Americans, or Germans, or the Russians. We always think they're a little bit particularly unique <laughs> in that they want to conquer the whole world. We don't. We just want to contain them. Oh, I want to get into this kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> this kind of argument is also universal the world over. Who is trying to aggress against who? Selfishness, inattention, <coughs> ignorance. Ignorance of who and what we are. All human beings. Certainly in our sorrow, in our suffering, in our greed, and our long and yearning for, for happiness, for pleasure, and our fear of pain. Aren't we all alike? <coughs> We're the Bushmen in Australia, or the professors in the university. priests of a church. The fact of universal sorrow and the fact that there's a cause to it. There's a four noble truths were pro proclaimed, not just those two, but also the, the fact that there is a deliverance from all that, a freedom, an ending of sorrow. and then pointing out some steps. It's called, in Buddhism, it's called the Eightfold Path. Sometimes very cumbersomely worded, also remote sounding at times and abstract. But the basic elements are, first step, right understanding. Right understanding of what is the cause of one's sorrow, which means one has to start looking. Second step is called right resolve. Very easily interpreted. Now I must take vows and make resolutions so I get there. The vow and the resolution isn't the important thing, but that one really sees that one needs to look, or else one doesn't understand. One just follows a doctrine again. The doctrine of the Eightfold Path. 
So the, this resolve is this the seeing, the absolute necessity of looking, understanding that unless one sees for oneself and understands, one just follows in words and in ideas. Another ingredient being right action, which comes naturally and immediately out of right seeing, there being really no division. Right seeing is right acting. Which doesn't mean one always has to do something. Sometimes not doing anything is the right action. Another step, right speech. Speech may be the one most wasteful thing in our life as far as energy is concerned. Not necessarily as a place for dialogue, for talking and discussing. Or unburdening, unburdening oneself, talking to someone, laying out one's problems. And yet there's so much speech that is so wasteful. Sometimes when there's tension in a family, one just, everybody just takes talking to sort of overlay this tension with a mantle of speech and words and topics which have nothing to do with what's really simmering underneath. One dare not tackle that. It's too hot. Attend to it. See when this takes place. And if maybe sometimes this sheet of, of ice speech, speech ice, can be broken. Not by immediately accusing somebody or saying, you're, you're really doing such and such. One starts with oneself. One doesn't immediately provoke defenses in other people, which come naturally when one is attacked head on. Right speech. We have two precepts, not to talk about the misdeeds of others, not to talk about other shortcomings, not to praise oneself and put others down. We, we recite it and recite it and we do it and we do it. silence and energy gathered in looking and listening to oneself and others. Right livelihood. Right livelihood. To do what doesn't do harm to others. And to do where one can give oneself what one loves to do, which is very difficult to find these days where there's such division of labor, such huge companies.
talk this summer to a friend, a young man, 22 years old. Doesn't really know what he wants to do. He said he was out of touch with his feelings. Really out of touch. He's gone to school and in, in Europe, Switzerland and Germany, going through high school is like nothing you, you go through here unless you take a medical or a law exam. It's endless studying and cramming, they call it cramming, into your head of information languages. He said he'd love to have some work which is of such a nature that one doesn't pant for a vacation all the time. That in the work there is vacation. So during the summer he goes and works for a farmer up on a mountain there, helps with the cows and whatever needs to be done. And then because one needs to study something, the son of somebody who's got a PhD, father PhD, mother PhD, PhDs all over, grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's all lifelong. There's been a subtle pressure, even though parents say, no, we don't, we didn't, we don't exert any pressure. One doesn't know how one does, just by one's existence as a PhD. <laughs> or MD, or whatever these Ds all are. <laughs> so, for the rest of the year, he goes to University of Institute of Technology, where he learns what is called agriculture, some agronomy. He loves cows. <laughs> <laughs> and the country, and the farmers, and the bread that the woman makes. But here he studies agronomy, and when we were visiting, he was ensconced in the basement of his house with volumes of books. It was a frightful sight. And so was he, pale and drawn, with rings under his eyes. Because we were visiting for a while there and talking to each other, he said he had to now increase his studying hours from six hours to eight hours a day. Just to, because over there you only have exams once a year, then all, it all breaks in over you. And these six or seven weeks of exams, you have to get all of that into your grint, he says, your head, your skull. <laughs> organic chemistry, and organic chemistry, economics, physics, biology, just because you want to be with cows. <laughs> it's a real deep concern of his. What is right livelihood? See, you really feel the plight. Although, and he also mentioned, he says, this, this intellect, it's all intellect. My whole life is only that. It's just overfed, like sort of a cancerous thing. He didn't say that. But growing and growing and growing. With this, we come to the other meaning of the word dharma. The word dharma also means order, order, harmony. Not just one element in oneself, this intellect, grown out of all proportions, fed and sustained and revered, revered out of all proportion. The praise you get when you come home with all A's or sixes over there, whatever. And the parents love you, they're proud of you. 
And even though my, one may say one doesn't care, one has lived on this, one has been nurtured in that all along. Very difficult to really see through that without working on this whole matter of seeing how we live in disorder with things out of proportion. As he said, I'm not in touch with my feelings. The fact that he could say that meant that there was touch with something. Order. Nature, where man hasn't touched in the very few spots left, is in order. The weeds, they brown the flowers, the plants, they brown in the fall. Here, there's a thick layer of snow. When the snow melts, they're all flat. Nobody has to pick it up, sort of put it someplace. They're flat and the new green comes up. New flowers come up. No one needs to make order. It's there. And in the heavens, the stars, has an incredible order which was observed very early by human beings and marveled at. And then came the idea, we have to order our human life according to that. And then problems started. The sun is the king, and the moon is the queen. <laughs> and then the planets that revolve around, and whole hierarchies and and systems evolve just by trying to imitate this heavenly order. When the king died, well, I don't want to go into all of this. It's very interesting. If you read mythology, how man tried to, to arrange his little micro-life according to some order rather than finding out what is true order inside oneself, which doesn't need to be imitated. Clarity, order inside. And then one will naturally create order around oneself. It goes together. If it doesn't, it is a compulsion imposed upon oneself and others. So I take my refuge in Dharma. What is one really doing? That's important. Not what one professes day in and day out. The last of the three refuges, according to Wei Nung, very simple. We take refuge in, in equanimity because it is the ultimate quality even among large numbers of people. It's interesting, really very interesting. He doesn't go into this Sangha at all. We take refuge in equanimity. Equa means equal. Animus is the soul or the mind. Equal mindedness. Equanimity, harmony, which is the ultimate quality, even among large numbers of people. You can say it's the only way in which large numbers of people can survive together, living together, if there's equanimity. mindedness. The refuge 
that we recite as we take our refuge in Sangha, in its wisdom, example, and never failing help. Sangha, originally, I read in the glossary of the three pillars of Zen, under the three treasures, says includes the immediate disciples of the Buddha Shakyam, the immediate disciples of the Buddha Shakyamuni, and other followers of his day who heard, believed, and made real in their own bodies the three treasures that he taught. So originally, Sangha, the immediate disciples, those who followers who heard, believed, and made real, meaning understood, saw clearly. And Father Downard says, the third, again referring to the third treasure of the three treasures, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, the third consists of contemporary disciples who practice and realize the saving truth of the three treasures that was first revealed by Shakyamuni Buddha. In other words, Sangha, Buddhists, Zen Buddhists, or maybe Bud all Buddhists who work with the Buddha's teaching, hear it, see it within themselves, do they? What is Sangha? Is it just the Sangha here? <coughs> people here in the Sashin or people in Rochester or people who are now in Santa Fe or on their way out there? Or other Zen Buddhists, including the ones in Vietnam and Korea? All, that, all the Buddhists, let's include them all. at the end of the Sangha? What happens if we take our refuge in that? What happens inevitably? Isn't there already some kind of distinction from non-Buddhists? separation of a kind, maybe feelings of superiority, maybe? Don't say no, no, no. This person has counseled with any number of married couples or people who live together where one member is a member of the center and the other is not. And most of the time, What has come out often under tears is how the one who didn't practice felt inferior, felt made inferior, or felt a subtle pressure put upon. <clears throat> Sometimes this was projected, very often the other one acknowledged that this was so, yes. One hadn't seen that, one hadn't been, you know, been aware of that. One had thought this was the right thing to do. One wanted to help that other person, <coughs> that spouse, that friend. This whole thing of helping can be so dangerous, this idea of helping. And one must look into this. What, what are the ingredients of this wanting to help? What is the ingredient of self-satisfaction in it? Is there? One must look at that. or guilt, or whatever. Or lording it over someone. There's pleasure in that. This must all be seen and acknowledged. And in the seeing, can there be an ending of it? So one can see the other person as he is or she is. Because he or she too is Sangha.
meaning equal, equal mind, one mind. <coughs> What is this one mind that does not differentiate, distinguish? Separate? Dominate? Submit? and yet doesn't pick up a spoon when a knife is needed. There's great comfort in belonging to a group. Great comfort in identifying with a group and with the name of that group. Then one finally is somebody, because this is our deep ache being nobody. And there's great danger in that. My group versus yours. Your wrongs versus my rights. Which happens among Buddhist groups as anywhere else. Even though, to my knowledge, there's never been a war fought in the name of Buddha or Buddhism. Why does one come to a center, work in a center, live at a center, work together, come to Sashin? Question together, sit together, eat together. Why? Is it in order to acquire an identity? Or does one need to work together to find out together? Find out about relating to each other, how one relates or doesn't relate. Not just within this group, where maybe there is a particular magnifying glass in operation where one can see very clearly because of the way one works and sits and goes to Sashin. But if does this does not radiate in the ten directions, without any interposition of identity or name, or borderline, and it's all for naught.
what makes for equanimity, even among large numbers of people? It has to start in oneself. What is equanimity? What is equal-mindedness, which means one mind, which means no mind? What is it? What is Mu? Who? What am I beyond all identifications and images and ideas and goals? We will end here for today. The Four Vows. All beings without